What is up and welcome to the third episode of the Bruin Bible. I am so lucky to be joined by UCLA beat writer for the LA Times, Ben Bolch. Ben is actually out in Tokyo uh, for the next couple weeks covering the Olympics. Ben, it only took you nine and a half hours to get out to Tokyo, is that correct? Uh, well, nine and a half hours from uh, the airport to my hotel, the flight, which actually pretty much uh, matched the flight time of about nine and a half hours. So uh, you combine that with, uh, you know, I actually flew out of SFO, I had a connection out of L.A. Uh, from the time I left my door in uh, L.A. to getting the hotel, I'm sure it was over 24 hours. So still catching up on sleep, but uh, don't want to sound like I'm complaining. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, man. Is this your first Olympics covering it, uh, you know, Team USA, or have you done things like this in the past? Uh, no, my very first. Uh, and it's I'm in my 21st year at the Los Angeles Times, so uh, something I've been waiting for for a long time, to be honest, and uh, just happy to, to be here, as they say, and, uh, and, 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 you know, do whatever I can to help our coverage. Well, Ben, I wish you nothing but fun out there. Cheer for our guys. Drew Holiday out there. We got 50 other Bruins competing in Tokyo, so that'll be a lot of fun. We're going to do kind of a preliminary breakdown of the Bruins football team. It's going to be a pivotal year for Chip Kelly coming up in Westwood. 10-21 uh, and 21 career record, 0-6 out of conference record career-wise. But they were 3-4 and four last year. They lost all four games by a combined 15 points. So they were in these ball games. They just kind of gave them away at the end. Returning 19 of 22 starters. Uh, ben, are you optimistic about the Bruins coming into next season? Yeah, it's. Re I mean, it, in a normal year, if you told me, I think they actually have 20 starters coming back. I think the only two missing are Demetric Felton uh, and also Digazua, unless I'm missing one. I think Jalen Irwin, uh, you could count him or not count him. I, I'm not counting him. Uh, so you could say 19 or 20, but – uh, you know, in, in a normal year, uh, I would say, wow, you know, almost everybody back, lots of experience. Uh, there, there's nowhere to go but a big season. However, I think some context is needed as you look at these rosters across college football. It's pretty common to see a lot of teams returning 18 to 20 starters. So um, that's that's going to kind of even out. I think the thing that UCLA really has going for it, though, that a lot of teams don't, is that they have a fourth-year uh, quarterback in Dorian Thompson Robinson uh, at the at the you know most crucial position uh, in college football. So that's going to be a big plus. And then also uh, you know they brought back four graduate transfers for a second season, and they're going to all be big contributors as well. So uh, you know I I do think that it sets up nicely, just kind of big picture wise, uh, with, with all these guys coming back at, at key positions. And a lot of experience and, you know, really no more no more excuses for, for not having a great season at UCLA. DTR, as you mentioned, coming back for his senior year, um, looked, you know, he looked, he looked like he made a jump last year. This is the first year he completed over 60% of his passes. Still had a couple, you know, head-scratching interceptions. But I think it's, you know, realistic to expect this guy to be one of the best quarterbacks, you know, within this Pac-12 Maybe not even more than that. Maybe in the country, where do you see DTR, and what do you think his ceiling is for his senior year? Yeah, I mean, I expect him to, you know, challenge for for Pac-12 Player of the Year, and and if UCLA has the season it wants, I mean, he could, you know, even be a kind of a dark horse Heisman guy. I mean, that that obviously would be a best case scenario, but uh, why not? I mean, there's still, as we've already alluded to, uh, there's there's returning guys in every spot. UCLA really. Um, knows Chip Kelly's system now, and, and, and Dorian should be able to fully kind of capitalize on, on, on what Chip wants out of him. And I think, as you alluded to, he's got the big, the big things for him, as far as I'm concerned, are uh, turnovers and, uh, you know, just making, making the play that would get, they say, you know, survive and get to the next down instead of turning the ball over. I think he had four turnovers in that Colorado game uh, last year, and they were playing catch up the rest of the way. So he can't. He can't do something like that and expect them to, to, to win games. He's just got to play within himself because, let's face it, he's got all the talent in the world, uh, and now he just kind of has to, has to showcase it week-to-week uh, -week consistency wise And I want to give you a prediction because I asked Mike Regalado, uh, who writes for Bruin Report last time, 
Um, do you think it's conceivable? 3,800 yards and 30 touchdowns through the air. And I uh, picked this for a very specific reason. That was Brett Hundley's best year passing as a Bruin, which was 2012. Do you think he can surpass those numbers uh, come 2021? Yeah, absolutely. I don't. I don't want to put a ceiling on anything that Dorian can do. I think that he can uh, establish all sorts of records. I haven't looked closely at uh, you know. The, I think he's sixth on the career passing list. I want to say. Uh, I'm not sure what he needs to, to to get to like number one or number two, but I, I think as as we've alluded to, I mean, just a, a monster ceiling could be kind of here on the horizon for him. And and you know, he really wants to. But, but as he said, and to his credit, it's not about him. It's about making this team uh, much better than it's been uh, his first three years. Last year, obviously, they were on the cusp of, of having a good season. Uh, but I think he really wants to go out with, as, as he used the word, he wants to go out with a bang uh, and, and have you know a, a season where they're at the very least in contention for the Pac-12 South, if not uh, the, the, the winning the whole conference. I want to go to the receiver room now. Kyle Phillips coming back. He's been the lead pass catcher for the past two years. Um, he looks great out of the slot. He's a great returner as well. Uh, Chase Coda, a guy who came in highly coveted. He was a Army All-American. He's only had 100-yard receiving game since he's been a Bruin. It's kind of, you know, make or miss time for Chase. But the guy that I'm really excited about is the tight end, Greg Dulcich, and just seeing some of the flashes he was able to do. He looks like he is really in the hunt if he hits what you know he was doing last year uh, for the Mackey Award at the end of the year, which is the nation's top tight end. Uh, the game he played against USC can only be a confidence builder. He had a 69-yard touchdown catch, 10 catches, 167 yards. Um, doing that against your crosstown rival is pretty impressive. What do you see from the receiver room in Dulcich? Yeah, I would say the one the one question mark with UCLA's offense is can they really find kind of that deep threat uh, that can kind of take the top off off the defense and, and uh, you know, stretch the field? That's been the one area that where they've kind of struggled uh, under Chip Kelly. They've obviously had a running game that's been among the best in the Pac-12 every year, uh, and, that you know, that's Chip Kelly's forte. But they really need, I, to me, to – become the offense they want to be they really need that deep threat they really need kind of that guy who, who can, can outrun everybody and, I, and I'm still not sure that they have that right now I thought every, we thought that Jalen Irwin, Irwin might be that kind of guy but he's he, he was uh, he, he didn't play much last year I believe he was in COVID protocol and uh, and left the team so they're ser- still searching for that guy you know they've got some young guys uh, Logan Loya some of the guys who you know haven't really Cam Brooks themselves. Who were, who, were, who were highly rated uh, before they got to UCLA. Um, and then you mentioned the two guys that we know really well, Chase Cota, Kyle Phillips, uh, really, uh, you know, looking for, for even more than we than they've given so far to kind of establish themselves as, as, as stars on a Pac-12 level. And then you mentioned Greg Dulcich, who's been kind of the Cinderella story, who now is just flat out among the best tight ends in the country. Um, he's really added... Uh, size to go with his speed. He's great, great hands, great feel for the game. Um, and yeah, I look for him, as you said, to, to have uh, a season that cements him among the very, very best tight ends in the country. And he's going to be, you know, potentially uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson's top target game in and game out. Love it, man. Uh, the run game, like you said, it's been top 20 the past couple of years. It's got a chance to go to a higher level. Um, the top seven offensive linemen returning, you know, highlighted by those bookend tackles, Anderson and Sean Ryan, who for my money could be a first round pick if he reaches his ceiling this year in Westwood. Uh, the two running backs, Britton Brown coming back. And then you got Zach Charbonnet, the transfer from Michigan. Um, I know you weren't able to get the spring practice, but what have you heard about Charbonnet uh, for uh, the, the Michigan transfer? Yeah, I mean, he's supposed to really give uh... – UCLA kind of that really sturdy one-two punch where, uh, you know, kind of a similar style to, to Britton Brown where he's kind of the bigger, sturdier running back, r- runs hard, hard to bring down, uh, you know, gets yards after contact. So, you know, maybe if they see one of those guys go off the field that you can't breathe a sigh of relief because you can bring in another guy who can do the exact same thing. And that's going to make UCLA's ground game really, really hard to stop. And, one thing I'm interested uh, to see, I, I know that, as you alluded to, I was not out at spring practice, uh, but 
Uh, you know, there was a report that uh, Casimir Allen, who's kind of the change of pace speed speed oh. guy, uh, was moved to running uh, to receiver, I should say. Uh, so that'll be that'll be something to watch to see if that was just something they were playing around with, or if he's going to be kind of like a Demetric Felton role, where he sometimes he's lined up in the slot, sometimes he's at running back. I, I would imagine that would probably be the case if I was Chip Kelly. You know, you want to use this guy as many ways as you can to capitalize on that speed. So that's something to watch uh, as, as we get into fall camp and the season. We've touched on a lot of offensive players. I want to hear from you, Ben. If you had to pick one player on UCLA's roster to have a breakout season, to make a national name for himself outside of maybe DTR, who is that in your mind? Well, uh, are we taking Dulcich off the table since we already spoke about him? We did speak about Dulcich, so maybe not him either. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, you know, you alluded to the, uh, the tackles. I think that, uh, you know, Sean Ryan and Alec Anderson, uh, both outstanding players who, you know, linemen don't normally get the, the buzz or the credit they deserve. But I think those guys uh, – on both sides are just tremendous and, and really, you know, will spark whatever this offense is able to do. Um, so I would, I would probably say those guys, and, and I still keep waiting for Chase Coda to kind of break out as well. You know, he's kind of a solid guy, uh, but, you know, you kind of, it's kind of easy to forget about a little bit. You know, he'll make some catches, but um, as I alluded to, if he can become like that deep threat they're, they're seeking or, uh, you know, really, really, have more consistency and impact in the offense, then, then he would be uh, a candidate for that as well. And, I'm, and, I, and, you know, we talked about running backs. The one guy I'm really excited to see is the, uh, the, the, the I, I don't know if I, uh, I'm going to speak out of turn here by calling him the cowboy of the team, but Deshaun Mer- Merle <laughs> from Alabama, who's got his, uh, his ca- wears his cowboy hat on campus. He's got his own clothing line now. Uh, I don't know. Great social media follow. Yeah. If you saw the video that his commitment video was like the the best one I've ever seen, uh, basically showing his day in Alabama where he's like, uh, you know, lifting hay and uh, just running around in that cowboy hat. And uh, I I can't wait to meet him and and see what he can do. So he could be, uh, you know, kind of the the breakout among the freshmen. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how much time he gets. Chip, Chip Kelly hasn't normally given freshmen a lot of carries in the running back rotation, but, uh, you know, he, he could be an exception. He's got a lot of talent. I love it, man. Those are all great predictions. Keep an eye on Charbonnet, too. 11 touchdowns as a true freshman at Michigan. Fell out of favor last year with the OC, uh, Josh Gaddis, the new one they got. But this guy was a highly tattered recruit in Southern California, Oaks Christian, and now he's making his way back to Los Angeles for some big time, uh, hopefully, yards this year. Uh, let's move on to the defense. Uh, Jerry Azanero got re-signed. Um, his first three years in Westwood were very tumultuous, uh, to say the least. He ranked over 100 in each of those years in total defense, which, you know, for fans who don't understand, there's 130 total teams in Division One football. So if you're in the 100s, it's just not good all around. Um, he did make a jump. He was 73rd in total defense last year. Um, ben, were you in favor of them bringing back Jerry? What uh, is kind of your opinion on that matter? Well, you know, it's uh, it's been no secret that I've been a big critic of, of their defense under Jerry Azanaro. Uh, last year, I think that uh, Chip Kelly realized that they needed to make some changes, and he brought in Brian Norwood from, from Navy, uh, the defensive backs coach. But not, not just a position coach. They basically switched to the defense that Navy was running uh, with Norwood as their co-defensive coordinator. Now, Chip, uh, Chip and Brian are very careful to not say that uh, that Brian has become kind of the de facto defensive coordinator. They say that it's kind of a group process, uh, orchestrated uh, defense that a lot of people contribute to. But I, I don't think there's any uh, getting over the fact that Brian Norwood has a tremendous influence on what's happening with this defense. And in many ways, uh, you know, you could say that his imprint's all over it. And, and he is kind of the mastermind uh, at least uh, to a large degree of what they are doing defensively. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I know Jerry Azanaro is kind of getting into that uh, range of, of being close to retirement. And, you know, even if they do have a good season and turn it around, I, I, I'm interested to know how many more years he plans on coaching because I know that Brian Norwood has aspirations to not only be a coordinator but a Div- Division One head coach. Um, so it'll be interesting to me to see if, if, if he – 
kind of takes over that that position uh, on the way to becoming a head coach. So they lose Osa Odigizua, but they have a lot of starters returning from there as well. Um, kind of give me your thoughts on the defense. You know, uh, the secondary still had their struggles last year, but this is a team that led the Pac-12 in sacks last year. They led the Pac-12 in opposing yards per carry uh, going against the running game. There were improvements. Uh, what would you see from this uh, defensive unit for the Bruins? Yeah, I would say through the first five games of last year, it was a pretty uh, unquestioned successful turnaround, uh, as we talked about with the, with Brian Norwood bringing the four two five and uh, what they were able to do as far as kind of uh, mixing and matching fronts and coverages and blitzes. And I think it did cause a lot of chaos. Uh, but then we saw in those last two games against USC and Stanford uh, kind of a, a huge drop-off, particularly late in those games when – uh, you know, UCLA basically, you felt like they had both games won and the defense just couldn't get the stops they needed, uh, particularly in the secondary. I think that was a huge, huge issue that needs to be addressed this year. So, uh, you know, the defense, I think, is definitely trending in the right direction. The two things I think that I want to, two biggest questions I have going to the season defensively is, you know, how, who's going to generate the pass rush uh, to, to kind of uh, make up for the loss of Oso Odigazua and also, can the secondary uh, really buckle down and, and, and make the, the stops that it needs to uh, to stop uh, you know quarterbacks from routinely just shredding this defense? So that'll be interesting to see. And also, I should also mention the middle of the field has been a huge problem. Uh, you know, middle linebacker and and, and the secondary kind of controlling the, lots of open uh, areas that the deep, that uh, opposing opposing teams have been able to really exploit. So they really need to show up that area as well yeah like you said they need to generate the pass rush they had last year they're gonna get a lot of help with that Caleb Johnson coming back led the team in sacks five and a half eight and a half tackles for a loss this guy was all over the field last year is it crazy to expect maybe a little bit more because he had five and a half and seven games I mean we, yeah. we think like nine or ten from Caleb Johnson this coming yeah, year you know yeah you know as you mentioned that one of the guys who really could become a breakout on a national stage, he, he needs to be in that discussion as well because he was really tremendous last year, uh, you know, in a shortened season and, and given the full schedule and and, and a, a lot more games. And, and now that he's got the comfort level of being back for a second year with this defense, he really could make a, a huge leap and become, uh, you know, an all Pac-12, at the very least, caliber player. So I think you're right on there. Um, I'll be interested to see, you know, who kind of takes over that Osu spot. I know they've got some veteran guys, Tyler Manoa, Otito Agbonia on the line. Uh, really need to see them step up. And I want to see Martin Andrus, if he can come back from that just terrible knee injury he suffered before the Oregon State game in warm-ups two years ago. Uh, we have really not seen him back since. I was, you know, hoping he could come back at the end of last year. Just wasn't ready. Uh, you know, being being a 300-pound guy with a with a torn anterior cruciate ligament, it takes a little bit longer to come back from. So hopefully he can come back and, and, and make an, uh, a big impact, and, and that would be a huge boost. The wild card I have coming from the pass rush situation is Agude, the uh, community yeah. college transfer that they have. I mean, when you're getting more tackles for a loss than games played, he had eight and a half as well tackles for a loss, two and a half sacks. From his first year from uh you know the community college route i mean that is just damn impressive and you know doing that in one year he gets another full off season this year with ucla similar defense all the nine and i really think he could be the guy that could step up for osa in terms of at least pressuring the quarterback getting to those plays um i also want to talk about the secondary a lot of familiar faces back there you know blaylock quentin lake quantrez knight uh, what do you think about those three guys coming back, and do you think they can really kind of become a better unit and arguably probably their their final year in Westwood? Yeah, it's going to be really uh, kind of crucial to what they want to do. I mean, I think Quentin Lake individually had some really good moments last year. We saw him break up a, a pass at the end of the Arizona State game that basically saved that game for UCLA. They would have lost that game. Jaden Daniels made a, a pass. It looked like maybe it was going to go for a game-winning play, but Quentin Lake was there. Um, Quantrez Knight brings the the, uh, the juice, as they like to say. Uh, he's, yeah. he's kind of a, 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 a guy with infectious energy and enthusiasm uh, and a playmaker. You know, we see him with some blitzing and some uh, 
just big hits. Uh, he's a guy that the rest of the defense feeds off of. But as you said, I mean, they just need more kind of cohesiveness and consistency. Uh, you know, Blaylock needs to, to be, uh, you know, more consistent in his coverage. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to see more out of Obi Ebo, who at times, uh, you know, had some breakdowns last year. So, so those are some of the guys who really need to kind of come together. Uh, you know, they made some good individual plays, but the, the consistency factor and, uh, you know, making plays late in games like that Quentin Lake one I alluded to. Yeah, Quinn Lake, another play, too, was that SC interception he had. I was talking about this with Mike last week. Um, first interception of the game. He's guarding Amon Ross St. Brown, who's, you know, a very coveted NFL player. He's a fourth-round pick. Read it perfectly, turned around midair, high-pointed the football, brought it in on Slovis, who's an NFL quarterback of his own. And you just see those flashes, and you go, this guy could make, you know, maybe he's not a day-one draft prospect, but if he reaches his ceiling – you know, his dad played in the league, former UCLA Bruin as well. This guy has the the talent. He's only played over five games once in his career. Uh, if Quinn Lake can be on the field for the Bruins this year, I think this secondary can really improve themselves. Um, another point I want to make, Ben, is Quantrez Knight. He's kind of the blitzing safety, as you mentioned. For those who follow the NFL, uh, UCLA uses him kind of similar to how the Seahawks use Jamal Adams. He's blitzing all the time coming up for the run, great anticipatory skills. The guy can do it all. Like I, Blaylock as well, as you were uh, you know, talking about, this guy has made some plays. He had two picks last year. He even had a pick against SC. Uh, but just the inconsistencies, he'll get burned on one play, you know, and it kind of you know breaks his stride a little bit. Um, you know, I think we touched the defense. It's looking great. I want to talk about some of the other Pac-12 teams. Uh, I know you got it. you're in Tokyo, Ben. I'll get you out of here in no less than 10 minutes. Um, the main competition of Pac-12 South, USC, Arizona State, Utah, um, you know, Keaton Slovis for SC, Jaden Daniels for Arizona State, Kyle Whittingham for Utah always has great rosters out there. Uh, who are you most worried about and why uh, when it comes to UCLA? Maybe, you know, running the table and potentially being the Pac-12 South champions if everything goes right. Yeah, I think we'll have a good early indication of this team uh, potential because they play LSU in game two at the Rose Bowl. Um, I'm a little bit curious as to what LSU is going to have this season. I mean, obviously they're 18 months removed from the national title, but last year was really kind of a, a, a lost season where I think they went 5-5 five and five was their final record, and that's, you know, <laughs> I'm sure that the, that did not please the fan base in Baton Rouge, but... Uh, I think what we'll know, should know by the end of that game, whether, whether you, UCLA is going to have kind of the huge bounce back season or not. I mean, they could, they could lose the game and still have a really good season, but if they get blown out, uh, I think that would be, that would, that would sound some alarm bells. But as far as, you know, getting into the Pac-12, um, the, the, the key, the couple of the key things that I, I think about, uh, you know, UCLA has not won at the Coliseum since 2013, which uh, is a long time, and they really have had a trouble winning in there, uh, even with, uh, you know, Josh Rosen was, wasn't able to do it. Uh, and so that's going to be, you know, a, a big hurdle to get over. They have to play at Utah, uh, which is going to be hard. I think they have Arizona State coming to the Rose Bowl, but, you know, Jaden Daniels, I believe, uh, is, is now 0-2 in the head-to-head -head against DTR. So you know he's going to be very eager uh, to, to win that game. Um, so as you alluded to, I think those are the, the, the kind of three huge stumbling blocks in the South. And then when you think about UCLA's schedule this year, uh, it is tougher than, than it could be because they have Washington and Oregon instead of Oregon State and Washington State. So anytime you get that combination, uh, it makes it a lot harder to, to, to stack up wins. Uh, so if UCLA uh, has a finish this this season with eight or more wins, they're going to really deserve uh, to be to be uh, you know patted on the back because they do have one of the harder schedules in the conference. All right, I want to do a separate section now. We do prop bets, kind of coming into the season. Uh, you said eight or nine wins. We'll get it at eight and a half. Are they over and under eight and a half wins when all is said and done for twenty twenty one bet? Oh wow. Uh, you know, I always come in 
saying that they've got it figured out now and they're going to have a big site season. I've fallen into that trap, I think, the last three years. Uh, and so, you know, maybe if I go the other way, they, they actually will this year. But I, I, I just think until I see it, I, I have to see it to believe it. So I'm going to go with the under on that. Even though I think okay. this, could, this could be a nine or ten win team, I just have to see it to believe it, to be honest with you, after three years of 10 and 21. But uh, so I'm going to go under on that. And I already asked you about DTR's passing numbers, if he could eclipse Brett Hundley, so we won't go there. But I will go rushing. Is Does he get over 700 yards on the ground and 11 touchdowns? Because that also matches Brett Hundley's best year running the ball. He was a phenomenal dual-threat quarterback for UCLA in the early 2010s. Does he get over 700 yards and 11 touchdowns? Uh, I'm going to say no, uh, not because he can't do it. I just think they don't need him to do it. I think with the running game that we alluded to, um, certainly they will mix in some some Dorian runs and it'll be a, an element to the offense that's very important, but I don't think they're going to make it something that's a staple of the offense. So I'm going to say he's, he's under that. Under that one. We'll move to the running back room. Britton Brown coming back, very talented running back. He was averaging over six yards a carry last year, coming back for his final campaign. And Charbonnet, the transfer. I'm going to combine their rushing yards. We're going to go over under 1,900 yards, and we'll Ooh. say two touchdowns between the two of them. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty lofty number there. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I keep saying they're capable of, but uh, yeah, I just think that's that's a lot. That's a huge number. Uh, so I'm going to go with the under, but I think that I will predict that at least one of those guys will top a thousand yards. Uh, and I expect them both to have very good seasons. I just think that's a huge, huge number to, to reach. So I'm going to go with the under. It is big. I do want to clarify that. But playing devil's advocate, that line returning and those linemen we were talking about with Anderson and Sean Ryan on the tackles, as well as, you know, all the interior linemen returning. I mean, there's going to be some big holes coming there for the running game. So we're going to go under on the 1,922 touchdowns. Uh, receiving room, Chase Coda and Kyle Phillips. Uh, Coda, as we mentioned earlier, hasn't really met expectations just yet, but he does have another year to play. Um, let's go 1,400 yards between the two of them and 16 touchdowns over under. Uh, if you had thrown Dulcich in there, I would say over, but uh, between those two, I'm going to go under. Okay, under. Kyle Phillips, man, he's he's pretty good. <laughs> I like him a lot, but uh, yeah, I, I just think that this offense is going to be very run heavy, uh, and I think that they have too many receivers, and, and they like to spread it out, especially amongst the tight ends. So I think that those guys are not going to be able to pile up huge numbers. All right, here's the Dulcich one I have for you, because he averaged 20 yards a catch last year, and he got 500-plus receiving yards in seven games. Does he get 50 catches? Does he get 1,000 yards? Does he have double-digit touchdowns, Ben? I'm going to go on the optimistic side here uh, and say he does. I, I think that he's oh. going to have a season that's going to make him one of the all-time greats at UCLA. I think that's my one prediction uh, that I'm going to go out. Uh, and not really even on a limb because we all know he can do it. But I, I just feel really confident in this guy's ability, his mindset. I mean, I just like everything about Greg Dulcich. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes on that one. And I mention this every time because you just have to throw it in. This guy was a walk-on. Anyone could have had this guy in the Pac-12, stays at UCLA, tears it up. And I've mentioned this before, too. I'm a big 49ers fan. He reminds me of another 85. He reminds me of George Kittle out there because he does a little bit of everything. He's a great blocker, great route runner, doesn't avoid contact, uh, stays in bounds. I mean, that 60-something yard touchdown he had against SD. That's one of the best plays you'll see from a tight end around the country right there. So we're going over with Dulcich. I love it. We're going to move to the defensive side of the ball. We were talking about Caleb Johnson earlier. Eight and a half sacks. He had five and a half last year in seven games. Does Caleb Johnson get eight and a half sacks for the Bruins? Yes. I'm going to, I, I think that he's, he, you know, he could be a, he could be a 10 sack guy. Um, he really could be one of these national guys. I, I like, I, I like his uh, aggressiveness, his instinctiveness, uh, just his attacking mentality is really, really impressive. You know, he used to be a bouncer at a bar, so he knows how to deal with uh, <laughs> people. He's got to move out of the way. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the over. Man, I love it. I didn't even know about the bouncer part. That's incredible. <laughs> um, and then let's move to the secondary. Quentin Lake 
He's kind of the guy I'm anticipating to lead that secondary. Quantrez Knight might be the vocal leader. Quinn Lake, I feel like, has the most talent out there. Does he get over under three interceptions if he is healthy this year? Oh, over, way over. I think he could be like a, a six or a seven. Oh. A six or a seven interception guy. I think he's going to have a huge season. I mean, he's got the lineage. He's He's got the talent. Um, so I, I think that uh, he's poised for a huge season. Man, kind of can have a Raheem Moore 2009 year where he went double digits at 10, I believe, 9 or 10. Un- unbelievable stuff from Raheem Moore. Well, Ben, that's all I got for you, man. I wish you nothing but fun out in Tokyo. I can't tell you how jealous I am that you're going to the Olympics. One of on my bucket list for sure. Ben, have an awesome time out there, man, and uh, let's talk again soon. All right, thanks so much for having me on.